Good morning, everybody. How are you? Hope you're having fun. Uh, my name tag does say Chris Hauser, but you can all call me Chowser. Um, I'm going to do this. All right, so, and I'm going to be talking about condition systems. If I can get this thing to work. All right, this is not good. All right, we're going to have to do it this way. Okay, here's my outline. I'm going to talk about a problem, and I'm going to go into detail and exaggerate if necessary to make it sound really bad. Then I'm going to describe a solution, and it'll be a great solution. You could even call it a silver bullet. Now I'm going to, after that, I'm going to introduce a library that implements that solution, and I'm going to give it a clever name, and then talk about only the good things in the library. <laughs> And because it's me, I'm, I'm probably never actually going to release the library. So, <laughs> all right. That's not, that's not my outline. My actual outline is I'm going to talk about some of the options you have uh, when it comes to handling errors. Um, and then we're going to talk about Common Lisp. Its condition system um, provides a lot of those options for you, so you can choose. Um, am I speaking loud enough? Can everybody hear me in the back corners? OK. Um, Okay, and then I'm gonna look at some, uh, we're gonna show briefly some of the libraries that are already available for Clojure that implement condition systems of their own. And then um, we're gonna talk about a, a sort of a built-in condition system that's already in Clojure that you can use if you need it without a library. And then I'm gonna talk about why none of them are silver bullets, but they all may have uh, be good options that you'd wanna use in various circumstances. Okay, this, this is the happy path. It wanders through beautiful and clever libraries. It's where we like to spend our time, and it is the setting for most conference talks. It is a place where memory doesn't run out, networks are never disrupted, directories are never missing, and disks never fill up. It's a lovely place to be, and not where we're going to be spending the next 40 minutes. This is the sad path. <laughs> this is where writes fail because the disk is full, data can't flow because the pipe is closed, Connections fail because the network is down. Constructors error out because memory is full, and people constantly try to divide things by zero. So what do you do when you find yourself on the sad path? So here is a, uh, here's a solution, an answer from the 70s. The action taken after detecting a software error should be uniform for all components in the system. This leads to the difficult question of what action to take when an error is detected. The best action is immediately to terminate the program. <laughs> okay, but we've heard this advice before, right? Where have we heard the let it crash? Erlang. Um, also, interestingly, True64 Unix, which was a, an older Unix operating system. Uh, if I remember correctly, even a single null pointer exception, right, a dereferencing of a null pointer would lead to the entire kernel, the entire operating system crashing and producing stack traces that might even worry a closure programmer. <laughs> so this is an option that, that, that makes sense. And as it turns out, True64 was incredibly stable because the uh, engineering team was motivated to prevent this from happening, right? But what about apps with interactive user interfaces? Mobile apps, web browsers, and that sort of thing. You don't really want them crashing anytime there's even the slightest unexpected uh, behavior, right? So we've got a range of options here, and I'm going to talk briefly about each of them. But you see at the top here are sort of the more dramatic, um, harder to ignore responses. And down at the bottom are um, easier to ignore or, or more subtle responses. And this probably isn't a complete list, but it should give you sort of the sense of the range of things you can do. Um, and the extremes are both a little scary, right? Crashing every time might be worrisome, uh, but also, um, just recovering and, and, and going forward um, might cause problems, too, if, if you needed to know about that error. So let's just look at each of these briefly, um, because it turns out that all, all across the spectrum, um, somebody has chosen this as a, a default for their, for their system. So entering a debugger is what Common Lisp does by default when you uh, signal an error, if you don't catch it or anything. <clears throat> Throwing an exception is something, of course, we're all familiar with. Special return values. So this is kind of a broad category, I think. Um, Java, and here we can see some closure code. If you, uh, if you take the square root of a negative number, you get back the value NAN, right? Not a number. So that's a special value indicating that 
something went wrong. Um, Closure takes this uh, and uses it in a lot of places. If you take the uh, first item out of an empty collection, you'll get nil, indicating that it wasn't able to answer your question. Um, and I think uh, maybes, the maybe monads nothing value falls in this category as well. It's a return value that indicates something went wrong. Setting an error flag, right? C's error number is a little bit like this. You set a flag off to the side somewhere that you have to check later to find out whether an error happened. And actually, we use this in Clojure. Um, Clojure's agents have a couple of different error modes, and one of them is to uh, set a flag inside the agent itself to indicate that something went wrong. And you can use agent errors to go back and check and see if there is an error sitting there waiting for you. And finally, recover and keep going. Um, so another Unix operating system you may have heard of, um, I believe, if I understand correctly, uh, if you dereference a null pointer inside of the Linux kernel, you'll get an oops which is a little message in a log that you probably never look at. So I think it's kind of interesting that we have Unix operating systems that have chosen opposite ends of the spectrum here. So these are all potentially reasonable choices. Now, I'm going to scoot that off to the side here a little bit and mention three other things <clears throat> about who chooses the response that's going to be taken. So um, I'm, I'm quite confident that there have got to be more options here, but these are the ones I was able to find. The detection site, so the moment you discover there's an error, you could choose one of these uh, responses. The enclosing dynamic scope sometimes can um, influence the option that ends up being chosen. And finally, the, um, the object itself will sometimes uh, contain an error handler. And so anything that can create or mutate that object um, may be able to choose one of these options. So this is probably one of the more practical slides in this talk. Um, so one of my main points is Think about this. Anytime that you are, especially if you're writing a library or something where you notice that you have an error and you need to propagate it to someone, think about your options. There's a wide range of options. Don't just assume that throwing an exception is the right thing to do. Think about what, who's going to want to be able to control it and um, what kinds of options you'd like to have them be able to choose between. And we'll talk a little bit more about, about how you can implement any of those options. <clears throat> to talk about it, um, we're going to use some examples from Peter Siebel's book, Practical Common Lisp. Um, trying to get all the different combinations of, of possible options is hard, and I think he did a very good job of coming up with an approachable example. So we're going to go through that in a little bit of detail. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, we're going to look at four functions just for this example, and then we're going to change them a little bit over time as we look at different topics. So this is the uh, lowest level function in our stack, parse log entry. And its job is to check to see if the input text, which is going to be one line of text, to see whether or not it's well formed. And if it is, we're going to um, go ahead and parse it successfully. In this example, just returning a value because that's the happy path we don't care about today. For the sad path, we're going to throw an exception. So you can there see we're using xinfo, which is um, a closure uh, exception constructor, and giving it some parameters about the error, and then throwing it. This is going to be called from inside a function called parse log file. And the purpose of this function is to um, open the file and split it into lines for processing. And this provides an enclosing dynamic scope for parse log entry, right? So the call there to parse log entry means that um, everything inside the body of the lower function is happening within the dynamic scope of the upper function. And I want to distinguish that from lexical scope, in case anybody's unfamiliar. Um, the lexical or syntactic scope is just what's physically up there. So for example, the let um, form defines a lines uh, uh, local, which is only available uh, to that, that keep line that's calling it. Um, so you can't refer to lines down inside the, the lower function. It's in the, it's in the dynamic scope, but not the lexical. OK, we're going to keep zooming out here. Here's the next function up, analyze log. Um, the job of, of this one is to take a single log file and uh, go through all the entries and analyze each of them. More happy path that we're not going to look a whole lot at. And then uh, this top level function, this is going to, for our, our example, is going to represent the entire rest of the application above this. It's responsible for finding all the log files and parsing and analyzing each. 
So this is the highest level dynamic scope, and all the rest are, are contained inside it in a dynamic uh, way. So we can go back to this slide and see some of the choices that have been made, right? At the detection site, when we noticed there was a problem, we threw an exception. So that's one set of, of options that you can choose. But having thrown an exception, it doesn't end right there, right? That, that exception bubbles up through the stack of dynamic scope. And when it hits the top, if you were to run that program straight from Java, uh, from the command line or whatever, the whole process would crash. But crashing here is a bit of a problem because it means that a single malformed log entry, right, in one of those files that it looks through, if any one of them is malformed, the whole process stops right there. All the remaining log files and all the remaining log entries aren't even going to be looked at. So this is why we have try catch, right? We want to be able to catch those exceptions and prevent them from ruining the entire process. So here's one way that we can change this function. So this is at the um, sort of in the middle level here where we've got this keep function that's representing a loop, right? This is where we're going through each of the items. And we can put this try catch around the parse log entry that was there before. And now, if it's a malformed log entry, we can return nil. And that nil sort of communicates back to the keep that what it's supposed to do at this point is to skip this entry, right, and go on to the next one after it. So um, from our set of options here, it looks like this, where now the enclosing dynamic scope has chosen to recover from the error and keep going by skipping the entry. So. Um, oh, sorry. Let's see. Yeah, okay, so here are the two uh, important functions that we just uh, modified, right? The parse log entry and the parse log file. And so now we're starting to see a separation of concerns where um, we are choosing or discovering that there is an error in the lower level function at the top of the screen. We've identified the problem, but then down in parse log file, that defines uh, how to respond, right? And particularly, how to skip an entry. And it's important that this be where we um, define how to skip an entry, because that nil and the keep are communicating with each other, essentially, right? That nil means skip an entry. But this parse log file is also still doing all of its file parsing stuff, and is also the place where we're choosing to skip the entry. Right, so it knows how to skip the entry, but it's also the place where the policy of choosing to do it is, is implemented. So we'd like to separate that a little bit more and give the control to somebody else to decide whether or not to skip the entry. And this is where um, try catch starts to peter out in its ability to, to do that for you. So um, we're going to switch to um, common lisp's condition system, except instead of um, using common lisp itself, we're going to use a pair of libraries called slingshot and swell. Um, Slingshot is a library by Stephen Gallardi, um, and Hugo and Duncan wrote a library on top of it called Swell that together provide an interface that's very similar to Common Lisp's condition system. Um, they're not always called condition systems. They're sometimes called resumable exceptions, or resumable conditions, or resumable errors, or just restarts. So those are the set of feature names that are sometimes used to talk about uh, these capabilities we're about to look at. And uh, my point here of showing the common Lisp names is not that I expect um, everybody here is familiar with those, but to show that there's a very close correspondence between what Slingshot chose to do and, and the common Lisp um, behaviors. OK, so now we're going to switch our, our uh, example over to using um, Slingshot. And so you can see the first thing we have to do is at the, that lowest level function, parse log entry, we're going to replace closure's built-in throw with slingshots throw plus. And you can see the parameters there are essentially the same, a little bit different order, but it's doing roughly the same kind of thing. OK, but now um, at parse log file, you can see that we are no longer choosing whether or not to skip. Instead, we're naming an entry called skip log entry. That's, a, that's actually a restart. So we're naming a restart called skip log entry and encoding how to skip, which is just to return a nil there. Right? So now at the parse log file level, all we're doing is providing the ability to skip, but we haven't chosen to do it yet. So now at a higher level, up in a log analyzer, and of course, again, this, this function represents anything higher in the dynamic stack. So anything that calls down into, um, down into uh, analyze log could choose to do this. 
and we've got this handler bind that we're wrapping around the entire um, body of this loop. Uh, slingshot uses a predicate up there, so that, that hash paren function at the top is, is a predicate saying that if this is the kind of entry of, of uh, error that has been signaled, then what should we do? And the choice of what to do is invoke the restart named skip log entry. So now we've separated concerns a little more. We've got a higher level function choosing what to do and a lower level function uh, implementing how to do it. But now that we've got uh, named restarts, why should we stop at one, right? So one option is the skip log entry, but we could do other things as well. Now if you remember, a skip log entry needed to be where it was because there was a loop there that was what we were skipping. It's an iterative thing and you want to skip one iteration. But there's other things we can do at the lower level. So down in parse log entry again, at the lowest level, here we're providing a couple other restarts. And these, uh, I imagine, are probably um, some of the most common uh, ones that people might implement. One is uh, use value. And so this means that some higher level code can choose to invoke that and provide a different output for this parse log entry function. So something at a high level can say, if you have any kind of error, instead of skipping it or throwing an exception, here is a value I'd like you to put in the output in its place. Maybe even more interesting is reparse entry, where a higher level uh, code can provide a function that um, takes the text that was read out of the file and change it around, maybe with, I don't know, a regex or if there's some common typo or something that would fix the problem, it can fix it up. And then notice it just calls right back into parse log entry with that new fixed up text. Okay, so um, is that making sense to everybody, kind of where we are? I'm seeing some nodding heads, that's good. So um, I just want to point out that, that we already have a ton of options here with just this one ability to separate these restarts from the, from the uh, detection code. Um, and this is, I think, where the bulk of the power comes from. Um, so here again, we have these options. So now we've talked about um, both the detection site and the enclosing dynamic scope and how those interact. Oh, you have a question? That's right. Well, that's right. So it effectively, I mean, it's, um, I mean, you can see the, that's right, instead of the throw plus, right? So it'll come down there and instead, and um, when that throw plus happens, if it has been assigned from the higher dynamic scope, it will instead go into the reparse entry and, and call parse log entry again. So then it will not revisit the. The throw plus kind of has to happen to trigger. That's right. So those are just named functions that are available for use by those invoke restarts that we saw at the higher level. Thank you, that's a good question. Okay, and this is something you can't do with just plain exceptions, right? So, right, so we've talked about these. Um, I have a brief segue here for this last one, the object creator, mutator. Um, it, it doesn't really fit in um, very smoothly with the rest of the condition system. Um, you could make it be so, you could choose to, to use them, but I just wanna make sure that we at least look at one short example of, of how it can work. I don't want to go into any detail except to show that um, this is a feature of agents again. So this is the other error mode for agents. You can provide an error handler that will have some side effect when an error is detected. Um, in this case, a joke about swiper not swiping. Okay, so here are some of the condition system libraries that are already available for um, closure. Uh, the first one is error kit. Um, it was created in 2009, which is about three months before Clojure 1.0 came out. Um, and I think it's a testament to Clojure's stability that in order to get it to work for this talk, um, I had to change two lines having to do with dynamic scope, and then everything else just worked. So that's, what is that, six-year-old code that uh, was working fine. Um, slingshot and Swell, we've already seen. Um, uh, Rybol is uh, one by Chris Zhang, who, and it uses pattern matching instead of um, pattern matching on the objects that are raised instead of just in, uh, inheritance hierarchy matching, which is what try catch usually does, right? Um, uh, BWO conditions is by Ben uh, Wolfson, and this one was interesting because it's based on a library for the ML language which is another language that, like Clojure, doesn't claim to have a condition system. 
So how is this even possible, that we've got all these libraries on Clojure, and mention here of a library from ML, that all provide condition systems on languages that don't claim to have them themselves? Well, here's an answer to that question from, uh, what, 97. So um, this uh, paper is primarily about um, formalizing dynamic binding, but then it goes on to show some of the uses of it. And one of them is um, when combined with an abort operator, you can define these resumable exceptions, which that Greek stuff there at the bottom um, uh, defines. And with help from uh, Jim Dewey, a coworker, um, I can say with some confidence that it really does, although um, I'm not sure I could explain it to you again now. <clears throat> so an abort is like throwing an exception, and the idea of abort was formalized in a 1987 paper which was authored by four people, including Dan Friedman, who has spoken at a couple of previous closure conferences. So this is sort of the, this is the underlying idea. And I, I'm not sure that this is the first time this idea was ever had, but it was formalized here. And um, this is the idea that all of the libraries that provide condition systems in closure are built on top of it. It's the same concept. OK, so we've got lots of, of options. So why don't we just use one of these libraries? And maybe you should, but there is um, a potential problem. And I think it can be called a, a composition problem. So let's assume for a moment that you're, you've started writing some awesome app, right? And you start using a couple of great libraries. Now, these libraries, of course, have dependencies of their own. So let's suppose they each use a condition system library. <clears throat> now, I don't, I'm not picking on these two in particular. My point here is that they're different ones, right? So, <laughs> What happens now in Awesome App if you start trying to handle these errors and provide restarts and that sort of thing? Now you've got a problem, right? You've got different kinds of restarts. Each of these libraries have their own syntax, their own macros for handling these. And although I believe um, there's, it's probably not undefined, the behavior, so it may not be technically um, the hard kind of composition problem, it's certainly going to make your code trickier than, than you would want it to be. And so what actually happens is most closure library authors know this, and they choose not to burden their applications with this kind of problem. So, <clears throat> so now we have all these features that we've just talked about that could be useful in some situations, and yet we're not allowed to use the libraries that provide them for fear of causing problems for applications above us. So what should we do? Well, the last chapter of Joy of Closure, um, has a mention, focus starts us on the path of doing this ourselves. And it turns out you can get most of the features of a condition system just with built-in features of Clojure without any library helping out. So that's what we're going to go look at here for the next uh, few slides. But it starts like this. The basic idea is you define a function representing an error. So in this case, the malformed log entry error. But you make sure that you flag it as a dynamic function, dynamic var. So now instead of throwing an exception, you just call that function. All right, so that one change, that one um, adjustment of pulling that throw out into a separate function, marking that function as dynamic, that right there gives you a ton of control and is exactly what uh, Fogus points out in, in the last chapter of Joy of Closure. So now that you've done that, um, here at the top level in Log Analyzer, <clears throat> you can see that we've replaced the handler bind, the special handler bind macro, with just Closure's own built-in binding form, where we are binding to that, that error function a new behavior, right? We're providing a new behavior. Instead of throwing an exception, you just return constantly nil. And we know from having looked at the rest of the program that that nil is going to go into the keep, and the keep is going to skip the entry. So right there, we've decided to skip the entry, all without using any uh, s separate special libraries. Um, I guess it's worth pointing out here that binding, the dynamic scope that binding sets up, is exactly the same kind of scope that try catch does. It's the same, same uh, boundaries, which is also the same uh, behavior as common lisps handler bind, and is also exactly what Moreau's paper shows. OK, so here's um, all the code that you'd need to change to switch from using um, slingshot and swell to using the built-in uh, behaviors of closure. But we've, again, we've committed the same problem, the same error that we did before in that, um, actually, before I mention that, 
I want to point out that this is it. This is, I guess I've already kind of talked about that, but this is all you need to do, right? This one little change, pulling that function, that, that throw out into its own function, gives you a lot of flexibility. But one of the problems we have at this point is that we, is one similar to one we saw earlier, which is that this function down here, log analyzer, is now use, exploiting its knowledge of the, of the interior functions, right? It knows that there's a keep and that nil is going to somehow skip an entry. So we don't really want to expose the implementation of one function into the behavior of another, right? So, um, so we want to do that uh, ability to name some restarts, right? So here's how you can do that. So we already have that, that error as a function, but now we can define each of the restarts as another dynamic, each of them as their own dynamic function. And at this point, if you were to call one of them, you'd immediately get an error because there's no behavior specified, right? That's also exactly the same behavior as you get in common Lisp when you try to invoke a restart that hasn't been defined. But now that we have those names, we can provide implementations for them. So we're now down back again at the bottom level function, parse log entry, and you can see we can now define both use value and reparse entry just like we did before. Use value is just going to return the, uh, the value that was provided by the high level function to replace the bad entry, and reparse entry will call back into this, uh, this same function. So this is the same behavior we saw before, now just using Clojure's um, binding built-in form. Okay, and then this is how you use it. So this is up at the top level, again, representing anywhere above this in the, in the, in the program. You uh, can bind that malformed log entry error function. So now instead of building in the knowledge of constantly nil, we can just call the function use value and provide the value that we would like to be used instead of the, the bad entry. So at this point, we've caught up with all of Seibel's examples from Practical Common Lisp. So right there, you can now go through that chapter of the book and, and uh, implement all of the features that he's showing off about Common Lisp just using Clojure's built-in features. Um, it is worth pointing out that the book also contains a nice little example of how to use a condition system to handle non-error situations. Right? So now that you don't always have to end up throwing an exception and causing something that looks like a crash, um, it might be worth thinking about using it in other circumstances. He's got an example of using it in a, actually I didn't write down, I think it's a, uh, another kind of parser where he's using it to communicate between functions within the parser. But that means that my point to you is when you are um, thinking about these, these condition systems, you might want to broaden your idea of what an error is a little bit and realize the similarities that it has to a, a callback. Right? This is essentially now a callback with a sort of dynamic scope for when it's available. So although this is where the book's examples stop, common Lisp goes quite a bit further, and we can follow. So what about how to catch, oh, uh, let's see. Yes, so a catch clause can uh, handle not just a single kind of exception, right, but a whole tree in, of an inheritance hierarchy. So it turns out uh, we can do something similar as well. So here's an example of what you might want to do. So we have this malformed log entry error, which is the only one we've been talking about so far, as if that was the one kind of error you'd ever have. But if you want, you can say that that is like a more general malformed entry for things that aren't logs, I suppose. And we've got some math errors I made up over here to sort of form a, an inheritance tree, right? So if we were using exceptions, this would actually be Java inheritance. But um, if we're going to use functions to represent the throwing of those errors, what we do is we just delegate. So you can see down here, we've got malformed log entry error again. And instead of throwing exception, it's calling the function that it would like to defer to, or the error that it wants to defer to. And that defers on up until we finally hit the general error um, function up at the top, which will just throw the exception. And so this allows um, users to uh, bind anywhere in that tree and catch all of the uh, all the errors below it in the, in the delegation tree. So uh, another feature that Common List provides for its error handlers is that after one of them has been invoked, uh, it can decline to handle it. So it can look at the inputs and say, oh, I thought I knew, just based on the, the error name or whatever, I thought I knew how I was going to be able to handle this. But looking at the particular inputs that are available, I, uh, I decline to handle this. I want something above me, something that was bound previously to, do, to handle that. So this is a, a, uh, you know, a handler declining to handle, which just sounds like that to me. <laughs> so here's how we can do this with our, with our built-in uh, 
functions, right? So this is getting a little bit messier, and now you can start to see why people actually wrote libraries for this, right? But the basic behavior is you use a, a let binding, right, a local lexical binding to grab the old value, the old behavior of the error before you enter your dynamic binding. So now you've got this, this uh, function, this behavior that represents you declining to handle the malformed log entry error. And then down inside your handler, so here when the actual malformed log entry error shows up, you can look at the inputs and based on them choose on whether you want to do something that was already defined, one of these restarts like use value, or you can go ahead and call decline and that'll trigger whatever behavior was, was defined at a, at a larger scope. <clears throat> okay, so we've looked at more and more complex ways to handle these errors and more and more code you can put around um, uh, your, your error conditions. Um, so here's a quote I really like, um, largely because it's from the 50s. Um, Those who regularly code for fast electronic computers will have learned from bitter experience that a large fraction of the time spent in preparing calculations for the machine is taking up, taken up in removing the blunders that have been made in drawing up the program. Don't you love the, the language? With the aid of common sense and checking subroutines, the majority of mistakes are quickly found and rectified. Some errors, however, are sufficiently obscure to escape detection for a surprisingly long time. So the question that I would like to ask at this point is, you know, if we step back a moment and think about this, um, do we really want complex code in obscure, cor obscure corners of our sad path, right? We already have, on a sad path, this is stuff that doesn't happen that often and probably doesn't get checked very carefully. So how many checking subroutines are you going to have to write to make sure that you don't have errors in your complex error handling. And so, as in all areas of design, we need to work to achieve a balance. So, here are my thoughts. First of all, consider alternatives to just throwing an exception. It may not always be the right choice. Try out the built-in condition system. Just, just try it. Every time that you're about to write a throw, just don't write it there. Move it out into a separate function, make that function dynamic, and, and try it. If nobody uses it, you haven't caused any particular harm. If you document it and people find it useful, you've actually provided a lot of flexibility to the users of your library. And you can rest assured that you can continue to extend that as necessary to achieve really as much complexity as, as you're likely to need. And finally, if you aren't writing a library that's going to be exposed to the wider public, and instead of writing an application where you have some control of the code all the way up to the highest levels, you might actually consider using a condition system that's out there and has uh, maybe put, been, had a little more thought put into it than whatever binding code that you're writing as you go along. So, um, just a parting thought from my friend Karen Meyer. The vast, the vast opportunities that we software developers have to make models that prove and expand human knowledge, but we're too busy plumbing. So, I'm sorry to have talked to you for a half hour here about nothing but plumbing, but I think she's right. So think about this, make sure you do a good job. Consider how to handle your errors, but then you know, move on and do something actually important. And don't squander a lot of your time thinking about condition systems. All right, that's all I have.